This content is independently created by Bloodstream Media. Novartis is our exclusive advertising partner. Welcome to the PH Podcast. Thanks for being here. Kay, what were you worried about when you were 15 years old? What would that be? That's freshman year of high school? End of freshman year, kind of going into sophomore year. Oh, God, what wasn't I worried about? I was thinking about college and prom and auditions for the spring musical and AP classes. I was getting a B in Spanish, which was really annoying. (laughs) Okay, so I was trying to get Bs, and I was definitely trying to get a girlfriend, mainly to have somebody to talk to. My skateboarding friends were not good listeners. All we did was punch each other and watch skate videos. (laughs) 15 was tough. It was tough. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out who I was. I did too, and I really had no idea that this would be like a lifelong journey. Wait, okay, so what does that have to do with this podcast? Allow me to introduce you to someone. Hi, my name is Alicia Kennedy, and I am a patient with PNH. I was diagnosed in January of 2017. Um, I was 15 years old at the time. On top of how stressful and confusing it is to be 15, to be in high school, to be growing up and going through changes that are confusing and scary, Alicia finds out she has PNH. Today, we're going to be hearing from Alicia about her diagnosis and what it's like living with PNH. Thanks for joining us. On the PNH Podcast. sophomore in high school. It's 2017, and Alicia Kennedy is about to find out her diagnosis. And it was, you know, like close to winter break, and, uh, you know, a lot of people have the flu and the cold and stuff. Um, so when I got sick initially, you know, we all thought it was just whatever was going around, and um, it just didn't go away. And it progressed for weeks and weeks, and I was extremely fatigued, and I was in pain, I wasn't eating, I wasn't drinking or sleeping. Um, And I started going to the ER, um, and, you know, they do your your basic tests, run labs, and, you know, just check you out. But they never saw anything of concern except for my hemoglobin levels. In case you forgot, hemoglobin is a protein in red blood cells that carries oxygen. And a hemoglobin test measures the amount of hemoglobin in your blood. So they would admit me, the doctors, you know, would come in, she has low hemoglobin, we'll give her some blood, and we'll send her home. And that cycle kind of went on for two, three weeks where I was being admitted and discharged and admitted and discharged, I think six or seven times before they decided to send me somewhere else. Um, So they sent me to a hospital two hours away. um, And that is actually the hospital where my current hematologist is at. And he was there in the ER. I guess he was awaiting me or he was on call or something. And he met us in the ER there and, you know, looked over all my stuff and my labs and checked me out there. And he was like, oh, you have PNH. And they admitted me and uh, immediately started treating me. And that was the beginning of everything. (laughs) We'll hear more from Alicia and a few more special guests right after this quick break. This is an ad for Novartis, the exclusive advertising partner for PNH, Fax Fiction, and FYI. Ever wonder, is my PNH well controlled? Or how bad do my symptoms need to get before I talk to my doctor? You can get the answers you need at explorepnh.com. There, you'll learn that any symptoms, mild or severe, may be a sign your PNH isn't well controlled. And that because PNH is different for everyone, it's important to let your doctor know how you're feeling. So, if you want to deepen your understanding of PNH, which can help you advocate for yourself and your needs, get answers and helpful resources at explorepnh.com. Brought to you by Novartis. We're back. Thanks for sticking around. PNH can be a very terrifying disease. This is Dr. Weitz, who we met last episode. You wake up in the morning and your urine is black. That's pretty scary for most patients. So you really need to be able to explain to the patient what's happening to them and why it's happening and what we can do about it. It is a chronic disease. 
And in, in the absence of doing a bone marrow transplant, these patients are, are gonna live with this disease for X number of years. So they have the same problem as other patients who have chronic diseases. They're always waiting for the other shoe to drop. So they have a lot of angst and anxiety about that. Dr. Weitz is referring here to one of the major challenges patients with rare and chronic diseases face, increased strain on their mental health. So I think emotionally, it was very jarring at first. Um, you know, nobody knew what was going on. And, you know, you're told you have this incredibly rare life-threatening disease. And, um, you know, that, I mean, that just, it changed a lot of things very quickly and it's hard to like kind of mentally catch up to that and to you know come to terms with you know this is your life now um constantly being in a hospital constantly having to receive medications and managing your health very closely nobody really knows what's going on except for you and the doctors and like you know just trying to find your place and getting the help that you need and, you know, trying to stay on top of everything and trying to stay on top of your life and working in school and whatnot. And, um, so for me, that's the most challenging thing. And um, I guess coping with it. The most common response from someone in this position, especially someone in high school who might already feel othered or isolated for any number of reasons, would likely be to keep this a secret, to try and appear normal at all costs. Right. And as we've seen in our work throughout various rare disease states, this can make coping with the new diagnosis much more difficult. But Alicia had a different approach. I try to involve everyone in hey, I have PNH, this is what it is, this is, you know, the things that I'm looking for, I need to stay hydrated, you know, if I'm looking a little yellow and pale, and I don't see it, let me know, like, if you feel like I'm getting sluggish, let me know, like, I, I try to tell everybody around me, those that I'm around most, um, you know, the signs and symptoms, and get them on the same page, so that, you know, they can help me, and I can help myself. And that really has been the most practical thing, I think, is like making everybody aware. You know, everybody knows what's going on and there's there's no barriers in trying to get the help that you need and managing the disease. Love her. Dr. Chonat thinks she's pretty cool too. One of the important challenges that some of my patients or caregivers have told me that it's one helping understand other people or their, their relatives and other doctors about what PNH is and the importance of managing some of their complications, uh, such as severe anemia, if they happen to go to the emergency department. Anemia is when your blood doesn't produce enough healthy blood cells. The second biggest challenge is that some of these patients still have to go to the hospital every two weeks to get their infusions. This missed school, missed work, especially if the caregiver has to go along with the patient, uh, again, remains a challenge. In my opinion, the most challenging thing is in the treatment aspect. Um, when I first started treatment for PNH, um, I was on IV medication. I was on Solaris, which is the two-week medication. Um, so I'd have to drive up to the hospital every two weeks, two-hour drive um, during the week. So I'd be missing school and my parents would have to take the day off work. And the infusion was also pretty long. So I think we were there for like four or five, six hours. And then, you know, two hour drive back home. And um, then a couple months after that, I was on the other PNH medication, Ultimaris, which is the every eight week infusion. And that was a little more convenient, but still, you know, you have to put everything on hold. Um, to go and see the doctor and you know my parents unfortunately also have to drop everything and go with me because I couldn't drive myself at the time and just you know kind of going through that and like trying to catch up in life again after that and rescheduling appointments and dealing with insurance and you know just 
the struggles of <laughs> trying to manage everything. The other biggest challenge, while there's several um, services offered, is the, the cost of the drug. And these medications are not cheap, uh, hence it actually puts additional burden on these families. In addition to these, it is not perfect. I think we still have a long way to go in getting the treatments right. And most patients do benefit from it, but there's still some patients may not ha get 100% relief so as to save from some of these medications. Uh, so it, the challenges are related to uh, the supportive care that some of these patients need around their uh, seeking hospital and hospitalizations, financial burden, but also that some of these patients continue to have symptoms. Alicia is on the younger end of the spectrum when it comes to patients who are diagnosed with PNH. We also had the chance to speak with Peter, as well as his wife and caregiver Marie, to get a fuller picture of what it's like living with PNH when you're older. I am Peter Millman, uh, the patient. Uh, I'm 72. Uh, I've had a variety of careers, but I'm retired now. I was diagnosed because uh, probably around 2020 or so. And it's a little bit hazy because um, this PNH has been the third of three autoimmune uh, diseases that I've had to deal with starting in 2024. The first was eosinophilic fasciitis. Yeah, 20, 2014. Uh, the first was eosinophilic fasciitis, which then uh, was mostly taken care of. Eosinophilic fasciitis, or EF, is a syndrome in which the tissue under the skin and over the muscle becomes inflamed and swollen. But then aplastic anemia became a problem. So aplastic anemia is where uh, the bone marrow fails to uh, produce enough blood cells of the various types, platelets, red blood cells, hemoglobin, uh, white blood cells. And then about 2020, the, um, it became clear that uh, PNH uh, was a problem, that the uh, uh, clone of the uh, defective blood cells had grown to past a certain level and we had to deal with that. Unlike Alicia, Peter didn't experience the traditional symptoms of PNH, that extreme fatigue and those flu-like symptoms. I don't know what other patients uh, are dealing with, but for me, it was, I have largely been asymptomatic. Um, that is that I wouldn't have known that I had PNH except that the uh, blood test s showed that uh, there was a problem, that um, the, uh, what is it called, the clone? Uh, had risen past a certain level. And, and, and so that's why I say that if I didn't see the results of blood tests, I would not know that I had PNH, except, you know, a little more fatigue perhaps than a normal 72-year-old would have. But other than that, it's, it has not been a particularly traumatic disease to have for me. Though Peter and Alicia are at different phases in their lives, they're both living through the same treatment landscape of PNH, which has evolved recently and pretty rapidly. As early as 2000, there was no treatment available for this disease other than what we call best supportive care, transfusions, iron uh, supplements, folic acid, but there was no real treatment for the disease. People used corticosteroids, but there, there are no controlled trials using corticosteroids. It's all anecdotal. Corticosteroids are an anti-inflammatory medicine. They're a synthetic version of hormones that are normally produced by the adrenal glands. Which are on the kidneys. Treatment looked really different as recently as the 2000s. So with Alicia being diagnosed in 2017 and Peter in 2020... What does treatment look like to them? Starting with a pilot case in 2003 and then through the subsequent clinical trials, complement inhibition has been shown to be effective in suppressing the complement destruction of the cells. And that is really the mainstay of treatment now. Complement inhibitors target different steps of the complement cascade. And are used to stop hemolysis, which is the destruction of red blood cells. It's evolved from uh, a C5 inhibitor giving, given every two weeks. 
So when I was first diagnosed, um, Solaris was the only medication available at that time. Solaris is a complement inhibitor. And, you know, my doctor would always talk to me about, you know, the, the news in the PH world, like these are the trials that are currently ongoing. And, you know, he would always involve me in these things, which was really great. And um, he got me involved in the study for Ultimeris which is a different complement inhibitor. So I was on that and then that became FDA approved and that came out. And in that time, they also came out with another drug called Pexidocoplan or Empaveli, which is the one that I'm currently on now. So in, I mean, in the span of seven years, they've come out with two additional infusion drugs and I'm sure they're working on so many more. And I know he's told me they're working on some kind of pill that you can take in addition to the infusion drugs. I feel very, very lucky that the treatment landscape changed uh, quite dramatically. Um, you know, the more typical treatments of using uh, Altamiris or Ravalizumab, uh, which I, well, I can't remember the, the name of the company right now. Um, that seemed, you know, that was in place for quite a while. It's a very expensive treatment. Luckily, we have excellent insurance. Um, but it was, uh, it was not working as well uh, over the course of a year or so uh, as time went on. And uh, when Empavelli became available, it worked much, much better. And it came in the nick of time, as far as I'm concerned. It's been a fantastic journey for uh, everyone who deals with, with PNH providers, patients, and caregivers. We, we started off in being able to understand PNH, and we were doing only supportive therapies such as transfusions. Now we have effective medications which can completely block the process of breakdown of red blood cells. Complement inhibitors. Yeah, we really got those down. And then we realized the proportion of patients who, in addition to that, they have continued anemia. So I think that landscape has changed from being able to control the disease to be able to effectively control the disease. But now we want to make sure that the quality of life and their uh, a variety of these um, scores, such as the facet fatigue score that we use, uh, continue to improve on these treatments. The facet fatigue score is a 40-item measurement that assesses self-reported fatigue and its impact upon daily activities and function. I feel like we have a really strong grasp on what their diagnosis and treatment journeys have been like. But how are Peter and Alicia doing now? Did living with PNH get any easier? Let's start with Peter and his wife, Marie. I would just say that, you know, our relationship, first of all, we have a very good marriage. And um, it's, not a, it's not one of patient and caregiver um, because my symptoms are not that serious. And we're more partners. We have, Marie was a, um, a faculty member at, in the, at the University of Connecticut in the Department of Neurobio... Ph physiology. Neurobiology. Physiology, <laughs> physiology and Neurobiology. And um, um, so although the immune system is a particularly complicated part of uh, the human body, the, the human physiology, she was really pretty well equipped to take on uh, this uh, task of understanding the immune system in general and uh, PNH in particular. That's where we were real, real partners. I, don't, I would not understand this nearly as well if I did not have Marie as a guide. I would just say, yeah, that, that I think that I can definitely play that role and it's very helpful, even if you're not a caregiver in the sense of nursing, to be able to be a partner and to contribute something. They are just so sweet. I love that despite the diagnosis, they've been able to truly focus on their partnership. The benefits of strong support systems cannot be overstated. We'll be talking more about the role and support of caregivers and family members of patients with PNH in the next episode. Wait, not yet. What about Alicia? I was getting there. I think over time, especially with, you know, the immense amount of support that I have and um, that I'm given from those around me, it really helped to come to terms with it and to, you know, kind of sit there and say, okay, this is what I have. And that's, I mean, it is what it is and it's unfortunate, but, you know, now I can build my life around that and make it something that I can work with and 
kind of uh, use the experience to my advantage in you know my life goals and career goals and stuff. Physically, I'm very grateful that I've not been impacted too much beyond you know getting back my I guess physical strength in the sense of you know working past fatigue and stuff and there I mean there's not been too much I'm still pretty much you know the same person I was before I just now I have a, a disease I have to manage. I am actually hoping to go to med school to uh, become a pediatric hematologist and <clears throat> following the footsteps of my current physician and um, you know hopefully work alongside them and the team that I see um, as a patient right now. Um, I, I feel like it would be incredibly fulfilling, and, you know, kind of like that full circle moment where, you know, I, th I came here as a patient and now I'm here as a provider helping patients like myself. I think that would be really cool to achieve and, you know, just broaden the landscape for rare diseases like PNH and other blood conditions that, you know, there's, there's so much potential and treatment opportunities and bringing more attention to those diseases so that, you know, they get more funding, more research opportunities, and more treatment opportunities for patients that are, in the end, more affordable and more attainable. I'm smiling so hard right now. Alicia is majorly cool. Being a patient with a rare disease herself, Alicia is going to bring a really wonderful perspective to her work as a provider. I had been wanting to go into medicine for a long time, and you know, like as a child, you know, children that aspire to be in medicine, like I want to be a neurosurgeon and I want to be, you know, these really like very elaborate, very, I don't even know, but yeah, but after my diagnosis, it definitely narrowed down to hematology and pediatrics in general. And as, you know, after my appointments, I uh, get to shadow my physicians and, you know, I get to see how they go about their day in the hospital, in the clinics, and you know how they're helping these other patients. And it's it's really been an inspiring journey, you know, to see how they help hundreds of people, and you know how they follow up, and how attentive they are to their care. And that, in my own journey, has really um, made it a very passionate area of medicine for me one that I can relate to the patients and one that, you know, it's just all so interesting to me. Um, and there's so much to learn and I want to be there to learn it all and give back to, to that field of medicine. While we wait for Alicia to become a doctor, does she have any advice for healthcare providers as they work with patients with PNH? Being supportive of your patients, um, I thankfully have a really great uh, medical team that, you know, they've been treating me since day one and they've been there. So we've developed a really close relationship and, you know, having relationships with patients like that allows patients to be more honest, in my opinion, and uh, more, I guess you can speak more freely with them. So like if something's wrong, you don't hesitate to tell them. Um, so definitely being there for patients is, in my opinion, the most important thing. Um, I've had physicians back when I was kind of in that in and out stage of being admitted and discharged where they almost didn't regard me as like someone that needed to be helped. It was more like I was an inconvenience. And, you know, it's not their fault. They didn't really know it's a rare disease and all that, but... Um, you know, treating patients with respect and listening to them and their needs is uh, incredibly important, especially with things that are easily missed, like rare diseases. So Alicia had a tougher time being 15 than you and I did. I think that is safe to say. <laughs> Alicia and Peter's stories provide fascinating insight on what it's like to receive that diagnosis, to maneuver through treatment options, and to form those relationships with your support system and your care team, all while navigating PNH. 
Thank you so much, Alicia, Peter, and Marie for taking the time to share your stories with us. And thank you again, Dr. Chona and Dr. Weitz for your expert insight on PNH. And thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time on the PNH podcast. Facts, fiction, and FYI. Facts, fiction, and FYI.